Our next speaker is a bit of a rock star in the AI robotics world. And as you listen and see his presentation, you will understand why. Professor Peter Abiel is director of the Robotics Learning Lab at UC Berkeley. He is also co-founder of Covariant AI, an AI automation startup. He's been an advisor and a researcher at OpenAI and also an advisor to many other startups in the Silicon Valley area, so he's traveled a long way. Dr. Professor Abiel's research focuses on making robotics uh, learn from people through techniques such as reinforcement learning, machine learning, and others. And he has won a very impressive um, lineup of awards, including best paper at ICML, NIPS, now known as NeurIPS, I guess, and ICRA, to mention just a few. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Peter Abiel. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, what I'd like to tell you about is some of the recent trends in artificial intelligence and where things might be headed in the foreseeable future. Let me first give a quick um, view on what I've been up to. So I did my PhD at Stanford working with uh, Andrew Ng. From there I went to Berkeley where I direct the Robot Learning Lab and I'm co-director of the Berkeley AI Research Lab. I teach classes in artificial intelligence and robotics. I actually very frequently we host uh, tours for kids. If you're ever in Berkeley and you want your children to be excited about uh, math, science, engineering, and it's hard to convince them by drawing things on the board, um, turns out robots can be very convincing. Reach out and we can give a robot tour and at the end we'll tell them um, to spend more time with robots, they should study math and science. We organize a lot of tutorials on uh, mostly deep learning. Um, frequently give executive level lectures on trends in artificial intelligence and actually once acted in a TV commercial uh, and a lot of people might say, oh, acting is not all it's said to be. I, I would argue against that. I think if you can be an actor, it's really fun. Um, had a great time and you should try to do it if you get a chance. Also founded some companies. Gradescope is a company where we build artificial intelligence for automatically grading homework and exams. So if you have any friends who are teachers and you wish they would spend time with you rather than grading their students' work, um, just tell them to use Gradescope and they'll save a lot of time. I was a research scientist at OpenAI for two years. Left there a year and a half ago to start a new company, Covariant AI, which builds AI for robotic automation. Um, I'm also an advisor to Preferred Networks, a big AI company in Japan, and also founding faculty partner to the uh, House VC Fund in Berkeley. All right, enough about me. So these days, when you read the news, it's very hard to not see something about artificial intelligence. For example, you might have seen this headline here. Stephen Hawking warns artificial intelligence could end mankind. Or Elon Musk saying AI is the biggest risk we face as a civilization. And in fact, you might see politicians getting involved. Vladimir Putin from Russia on September 1st, 2017, gave a lecture broadcast to all the kids in school in Russia, telling them that whoever leads the way in AI will rule the world. And there's now a country, the United Arab Emirates, that has a dedicated minister for artificial intelligence. And in fact, many, many countries are starting to roll out AI strategies um, to maximize their chances in playing a big role in AI in the future. And the main conference, uh, NIPS, recently re renamed to NIRIPS, um, sold out in less than 12 minutes. So it's almost like a pop concert where if you want to get a ticket, you got to hit refresh frequently, and then finally you get in, you get your ticket. And this is kind of crazy because this conference is just about people doing math effectively. Um, and it's all equations and yet uh, more than 8,000 people want to attend. So is there some hype? Uh, yeah, for sure. But actually there's a lot of progress being made also. And that's what I want to highlight here and give you some insights into what that progress is and what it might mean for you. So what's driving all these breakthroughs? First, maybe let's think about what is artificial intelligence? How can we be intelligent? 
I showed you two fundamental ways to be intelligent. One way to be intelligent is by thinking through the consequences of your actions. You think through the many things you might be able to do, simulate in your head what the consequences would be, and then pick the sequence of actions that leads to the best results. That's called planning. Another way of being intelligent is to learn from your past experience. If you see something that's similar to something you've observed before, maybe you can then reuse what you experienced in the past and make a better decision now. This kind of internalizing of patterns in data is where a lot of the recent breakthroughs have been, and that's what I want to highlight here. First thing you might wonder, how hard can it really be? Look at the screen here. It's a picture of a coffee mug. Nobody would get that wrong. Looks very easy. But actually, for a computer, it's not so easy. For a computer, it's just a bunch of numbers, the grayscale values of each pixel. And if you need to write a piece of code to determine from these numbers what's in the image, that's actually really hard to do by hand. So this is not a great representation to work with for traditional programming. Then what happened in mid-2012, big breakthrough, it was shown that rather than using traditional programming, it's possible through training large neural networks, it's possible to build systems that's, that can recognize what's in an image. Here's an example of a neural network. It's much inspired by how the brain works. Each individual neuron does something fairly simple, has a bunch of inputs, and then processes them by taking a weighted combination of them and then outputs it to the next layer of neurons. But by combining many, many of these neurons together in a network, you can actually do something very complex like recognizing what's in an image. In such a network, you can adjust the weights, the strengths of the connections between the neurons. If you have different weights, this network will do a different computation. And so for your network to make the right decisions for you, it needs to have the right weights. And training the network, what that means is finding weights that minimize the difference between what the truth is, for example, this is a dog, and the predictions the neural network makes. So the way you do this, you collect a large set of data, but not just data you download, you actually have to annotate the data. So for each entry, you might say there's a car, or a cat, or a dog. Then your machine learning algorithm will take in that data, and one by one, feed these examples into your neural network. For example, here, we're feeding in an image of a dog. When the neural network is started off, it's randomly initialized. So it's very likely going to make the wrong decision. It's going to predict maybe this is a cat. But then after it makes that prediction, there's a backward calculation that happens that will adjust the strengths of the connections between the neurons such that next time it's more likely to predict dog on this image. And this will repeat image after image after image. And after feeding through millions of images, it turns out this will start recognizing what's in images, including new images it's never seen before. You might wonder, how big of a breakthrough uh, was this? There was a competition called ImageNet. And in the ImageNet competition, the organizers have a secret stash of images. And to participate, you send in your computer program, and they will run your computer program over their secret stash of images, and then report out the number of errors your program makes in predicting what's in each image. In 2010, the best entry in a competition was a computer program with 30% error rate. In 2011, it was not much better. And this was kind of flatlining. But then in 2012, switching from traditional computer vision approaches to deep learning, Jeff Hinton's group out of the University of Toronto was able to have the error rate. And it was not just a one-time thing. People switched to this new line of tackling this problem, and there was a rapid acceleration in progress, going down to human-level error rates, and this competition by now has been retired. The example here is going from an image to a category of what's in the image, choosing one out of 1,000 categories. You can actually apply the same idea to go from image to describing with a full sentence what's in the image. 
For example, the bottom left here, we have an image fed in a neural network. It's never seen this image before, but it's going to generate a caption on its own and saying, girl in pink dress is jumping in air. Network takes in an image and now outputs a choice, one out of 200,000 words. Again, a choice, one out of 200,000 words, until finally M emits the choice that the sentence is over, and then the next image comes. What's particularly interesting about this result here is that in eight research labs, the result was achieved, the same result, essentially, was achieved within a month of each other. So labs at Berkeley, Stanford, Toronto, NYU, Montreal, Baidu, Google, Facebook all showed the same result. What this really showed is that at that time, if you had the right expert team, once a data set gets released, in this case a data set released by Microsoft with images and corresponding captions, it becomes possible to solve this problem. And really what it meant is that we had experienced a change in programming paradigm. Traditional programming is about writing lines of code. And definitely still has its role. But for pattern recognition type problems, this doesn't tend to work too well. Instead, what works really well is to apply deep learning or training large neural networks, sometimes now called software 2.0, where the program is not lines of code. The program lives inside the neural network. You change the program by changing the strengths of the connections between the neurons. And you're not going to do this by hand. That's not practical. You're going to do this by feeding in examples. And so this style of programming comes down to a new set of skills, two skills, actually. One skill is choosing good architectures for your neural network. And the second skill, which you're going to be busy with the most typically, is collecting annotated data of the right type that captures your problem, and then analyzing what does your neural network do now if it still makes mistakes, what's the new data you should be collecting and annotating to improve it? What are some example new capabilities thanks to this paradigm? It's not just for computer vision. In fact, out of Jeff Hinton's lab, big breakthrough around the same time, same lab in speech recognition, switching from more traditional approaches to deep learning. And in fact, um, students from Jeff's lab then uh, at Google build a neural machine translation system that's by now de been deployed as Google Translate. Here, input sentences in one language, output sentences in another language. You have enough of those sentences paired up. You can train a neural network to translate now new sentences it's never seen before. There have also been big successes in not just instantaneous pattern recognition, but decision making. One of the most well-known examples, of course, is AlphaGo out of DeepMind. Interesting story here. In 2012, before the first big breakthrough in deep learning, so early 2012, there was a big get-together in San Francisco, a lot of renowned computer scientists. And the person up front asked some questions and did a survey. This was 2012. How long do you think it's going to take before we have human-level Go play by a computer? Essentially, the consensus in the room was 20 years or more, 50 years or more, 100 years or more. Only one person said less than 10 years. This was 2012. Only one person said less than 10 years. Everybody else was very surprised by this person's opinion. But it only took three years. So this went a lot faster than people expected before it happened. And that's been a little bit of a trend, that a lot of these things have happened much faster than people anticipated. And this might continue. Why did it happen so much faster than people anticipated? Well, there's two ways to think about this problem. One way to think about it is essentially the planning way. How can this game be played? I make my move, you make your move, I make my move, and so forth. And the number of ways this can be done is many more than there's atoms in the universe. So if you think about, can we have a computer reason through all these possible ways of playing the game? Yeah, that might take another 100 years, because that'd be a really, really big computer. But you can actually play this game really well by doing pattern recognition, because effectively that's an image. A pixel could be white, black, or empty. And if you can train a pattern recognizer to understand how good a situation is, and for your current move, you pattern recognize for each option you have available and predict the probability of winning, then you make the move with the highest probability of winning and repeat. 
And now you don't need to reason through all possible ways of playing the game, you need to think only one step ahead. Of course, it's still better to think more steps ahead than one step ahead, but you don't need to think till the end of the game to play well. So far, what I've talked about is results of deep learning. What I want to show now is the actual learning in action. So what do we expect here? This is a robot, and this robot is going to learn to run. Initially, the neural network doesn't know what to do. It's randomly initialized. So what do you expect to happen? You expect it to fall over, because most settings of the weights in the neural network will lead to failure. You need to be very good to run, get the right settings. What's going to happen is it's going to fall over, but it's going to randomly try in different ways. And one of those times is going to fall over just a little later. And when it falls over just that little later, that will effectively act as its label, as its annotation. And it's going to do a back propagation through the network, update the weights to make it more likely in the future to fall over that little bit later again. And then that process repeats. So iteration zero, randomly initialized, but after 20 updates to the network, it falls a little later. After 80, falls even later. 160, it falls even later. And you see that over time, through its own trial and error, it becomes better and better and better at controlling this robot. And the beauty here is that there's no special purpose code for two-legged robots versus four-legged robots running versus getting up. And in fact, the same code can learn to play video games. Here's an example with a real robot. This is Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. Brett lives on the seventh floor in the AI lab at Berkeley. And what you see here, it's learning to put the block into the matching opening. And you might say, well, how come it takes multiple attempts? You could probably do it on first attempt. Everybody in this room probably can do it on first attempt. But if you think about it carefully, it's not really your first attempt. You've done, you've done many other things in your life that are similar to this. In fact, you might even have played with a toy like this as a child. This robot is starting from scratch. It's like a newborn baby having learned nothing yet, and then in less than an hour is able to master vision system and a control system to get the block into the matching opening. After some of these results, we started a collaboration with NASA. They have a new planetary exploration robot shown here, the Super Bowl. It's a bunch of cables and rods. It's a very unintuitive design in many ways, but it turns out it can be made in a very small volume for transportation, and it's also really hard to control. But thanks to reinforcement learning, it was possible to train a neural network that can automatically control the system. And actually, recently, at OpenAI, similar ideas were used to learn to control a robot hand that's much like a human hand. And so what you see here is the task is to match the configuration shown at the bottom right. This hand's been trained for a very long time, and after the training, we're watching it here in action, controlling that block, getting it into the matching configuration. One of the very interesting things about this experiment here is that this hand was trained only in simulation. So a simulator, actually many, many simulators were built of this hand, because real-world training can take a long time. And by parallelizing across many, many simulators, a neural network was trained that then still worked in the real world, which is always different from simulation, and succeeded here. Now, I've talked with you about supervised learning, where you learn a mapping from inputs to outputs, like image recognition, speech recognition, machine translation. Talked about reinforcement learning, where you learn to act. There's a third type of learning called unsupervised learning. In unsupervised learning, it's about learning from data that does not have any annotations. And a very popular way of doing this is through training generative models. So far, the models we've looked at have gone from something pretty large in, like an image, to a decision, which is often a smaller thing. What we're going to do now is flip this around. We're going to go from something small, a random code, 
to something bigger like an image. Code-wise, that's straightforward. TensorFlow, PyTorch, you just flip the structure of your neural network and go from small to big. If you just do it naively, though, you initialize the weights randomly, like you don't have much other choice because there's so many weights, um, you get images like this being generated. This is a 10 by 10 grid of images, each image generated by the same neural network with the same weights, but a different random code going in. But now if you train it by saying the images you generate should be indistinguishable from real world images, this is what happens. And we're watching the training in action here, and over time, figures out the setting of the weights in the network such that it generates realistic images. You can do this from random code to images. You can also go from image to image. So what we're going to see here is neural network translating horses into zebras. And in fact, if you can translate horses into zebras, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to translate one person into another person. Here, two Berkeley students, Tingwei Zhao and Caroline Chen. Um, they thought it'd be cool to have some dance videos of themselves, um, but maybe it's not that easy to dance really well. But if their computer code, their neural networks, can turn horses into zebras, they can also be trained to turn professional dancers into them dancing. So what we're going to watch here is, in the top left, we're going to see a professional dancer, and the neural network will turn it into them dancing. So. This is just a calibration motion. If you can do that simple swimming motion, you're good to go. And it doesn't need to be hip hop dancing. If you prefer a different kind of dancing, no problem. Maybe, I don't know, you might uh, prefer ballet. Here's the professional. You just do a very simple calibration motion, and there you go. If you want a video of you doing that, you just contact the students, send a simple sp spinning around video of yourself, and it can generate it for you. And in fact, some of these generation results have become so good that it's actually scary. Look at this. This person is not a real person. It's automatically generated. And whenever you change the random seed, it generates a new person that does not exist. If you go to that website, every time you refresh, you get a new person. You can do the same thing with text. So this text here is written automatically by a neural network. There's a prompt that says, in a shocking finding, Scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. That's the prompt. Now the neural net continues. It's read a lot of the internet, and it's seen the pattern of how text tends to continue. And it says, the scientists, need, the scientists named the population after their distinctive horn. Ovid's unicorn. These four-horned, silver-white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and so forth, all automatically completed by the neural net. In fact, some of this technology has become so powerful that there is starting to be a big debate in whether or not um, we should always open source the code that can do this, um, because maybe it should take some time to build countermeasures first to detect whether something is automatically generated and hence could be spamming people in very credible ways, but in ways that people wouldn't want. Um, and so a lot of thought has to go into that. What are some example applications people build around this? So deep learning really works. It gives us automated prediction. Um, what does that mean? Um, I'll use a quote from my PhD advisor, Andrew Ng, who says, AI is the new electricity. And it doesn't mean with that that, you know, we're going to power our light bulbs with AI or power our cars with AI. What it means is that the way electricity has 
become present in every single activity that we do, companies, daily life, the same way AI will become present everywhere. Because if you can predict better, you can run your company better. Here's an example. Yelp, restaurant review website. Top row, randomly chosen images. Bottom row, AI has been trained to recognize what is an appealing image. Of course, the bottom row will make you much more inclined to go visit this restaurant than the top row of images. Some very difficult things for humans, like dermatologist level classification of whether moles on your skin might be cancers or not, can be done by a neural network. Classifying whether an x ray scan is indicative of pneumonia or not can be done by a neural network. And in fact, there's a neural network that's FDA approved to decide when looking at the retina of diabetes patients whether or not there is progression of the disease in the eye and they need to go see a specialist or not. The decision on that referral can be made by this neural network. And of course, a big domain is robotics. Traditional automation is all about repeated motion. And of course, it's gotten some really nice results, car manufacturing, electronics manufacturing, textile manufacturing. But still, it's very limiting. For example, none of these problems can be solved by simple repeated motion. But now that we can make computers see, we can make robots see, there's going to be two big new waves of automation. The first one is one where robots will have eyes. Once you're not blind anymore, you can do a lot more. Second wave, which is going to happen in the nearest future, is that we'll have teachable robots. Robots where you can give it a new job to do every day. You just say, today this is what we're doing, and it learns on the spot from what you just showed it. This is actually the reason a year and a half ago, together with uh, some of my former students, we started a new company, um, Covariant AI, where we are building the new AI automation uh, for many, many partners in uh, Asia, Europe, and the United States so far to drastically expand the use case of what can be automated in their factories, in their warehouses, and so forth. What we're able to build is flexible solutions in their context. Because AI can now adapt to your situation. You don't need to reconfigure everything to make it into repeated motion automation. It can see and adapt. And we also work with them on the strategy uh, for the future of their warehouses and factories, not just what can be done today. If anybody of you want to chat about that, feel free to reach out. One question you might have is, is AI here to stay? And not just to stay, but is this kind of very fast progression here to stay? Where what we can do in AI today is so much further than what we could do last year and year before. Well, let's think about the driving factors. The driving factors have been more data, more compute, and of course, innovative uh, execution. More data is going to keep happening. We're getting more data every day than the day before. Innovation, well, we'll be, we'll be smart people in the future, too. But how about compute? You might have heard um, Moore's Law might start to kind of level off. It used to give us two ways to compute every three years, but now people are debating. Can we make transistors smaller still because quantum effects and so forth? It's not so clear. Some people will say, oh, it'll just, you know, it's not like the early part of that curve was easy. It required hard work. And we just have more hard work, and it'll continue. Some other people say we're hitting fundamental physical limits. We can't continue this curve the way we've been doing it by just making transistors smaller. Um, not clear. But there are other things we can do to increase the amount of compute we have. For example, there's now a range of companies building dedicated neural net chips. What does that mean? Moore's law is about shrinking transistors. This is about laying out the transistors on your chips differently such that they are optimized for AI compute. And the predictions are that such chips with the same number of transistors that we can already put on chips today, we don't need to increase the transistor count, we can get 100 to 1,000 times the compute on the same chip size. 1,000 times the compute would be 30 years of Moore's law. So this would be pretty significant. And of course, we're getting better and better at networking computers. The big result from 2012, AlexNet, image recognition, used an amount of compute that was large at the time. Just six years later, AlphaGo Zero used 300,000 times more compute to run the experiment. And then, of course, a lot of companies are making a lot of money through AI, which will continue to fuel the kind of resources going into designing AI chips and better compute infrastructure, software infrastructure to network computers together for AI compute. All right, so how about humans in all of this? 
Let's take a look at where we're at. Um, for example, a fly has 100,000 neurons. AlexNet, the big breakthrough in 2012, had 650,000 neurons. So this is interesting. We were able to build neural networks already seven years ago bigger than the fly brain. But all it did is categorizing into some thousand categories. So actually, the neural net we, as a community, built back then is not nearly as sophisticated as the fly brain. What it shows is nature is still much more sophisticated. But if we can design better neural net architectures, we might be able to already build something the size of a fly brain. Mouse is 100 million neurons. Human has 100 billion neurons. What matters for compute is the connections between the neurons, the synapses. Humans have 10 to the 15, or up to that, roughly, synapses. They can fire once per second or not. So a computer, equivalently, can do a floating point operation, flop, once per second. And maybe if we want to simulate human brain, that would require 10 to the 15 flops, or a petaflop. Can we put that in a box? Not just yet. But if we network 10,000 current CPUs, we can get a petaflop. Or if we just get 10 of the latest GPUs, we can also get a petaflop. So we are starting to get to a point where the amount of compute we have available is very much comparable to human brain level compute. This is going to disrupt society in many ways. It's going to be a lot of good stuff happening. Um, principle, there should be no more car accidents as we get uh, better and better neural nets for, let's say, driving cars. It will fuel discovery in many, many fields. Advanced math, physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth. Many diseases will be solved much more quickly thanks to AI compute assisting human researchers. Big tour de forces like going to Mars, which requires a really exceptional person today, still 10, 20 years of effort, and I'm not sure how many people in the world could pull it off. Very few, for sure. AIs, if they're equally smart as us, are going to be able to do some of those things too. There'll be a lot more wealth creation also, and many other positive effects. Also, some tricky stuff will happen. So. You saw the text being generated. This could lead to fake news stories. Same for the videos. Videos become indistinguishable, whether they're fake or real. That becomes very difficult to deal with. Face recognition is becoming really good, which could lead to surveillance uh, systems that might be more than we ask for. There could be malicious uses, but there could also be accidentally uh, misuses, where people think it's going to work, but then it doesn't work, and it fails at scale. Another challenge we have ahead as a society is that a lot of the top AI talent, probably all of it, is in private companies. We think about military needs AI too. The defense department needs AI. And there's been a lot of resistance, actually, within tech companies to participate in these things. So how do we get the best AI to defend our country, for example? Another challenge will be that jobs that you think of as routine, or let's say you did a job for two or three years, and I say, this job is now routine for me. I can relax, very easy job now, and that's it. Those jobs are going to disappear, because it becomes easy for you after a day or after two or three years. Imagine an AI monitoring hundreds of thousands of people doing that kind of job. It will become routine for the AI also. There will be extreme wealth concentrations. Because AI is essentially done by compute and data. If certain companies have a lot of compute and data, they can start accumulating enormous amount of wealth in very uh, small entities, which will be very tricky to deal with as a society. Many other issues. If you are curious to learn more about this, I highly recommend this book here by Eric Brian Olson, uh, economics professor at MIT, and Andrew McAfee. And they look at what happens when society has drastic changes in productivity. We used to be hunters and gatherers, then farmers. Then industrial revolution, service revolution, and now the intelligence revolution. How is that going to shape up? How are we going to deal with this? Then beyond that, um, you might wonder, are we going to build something as smart as us? Nick Bostrom, philosopher at Oxford, super intelligent book, argues that, yes, that seems rather inevitable, because this is just storage and compute. And that's what our computers are, too. We make them big enough, it's going to happen. This book is a warning. This book is saying, once we build something as smart as us, next day it'll be smarter. And we'll not be able to switch it off. Because if it's smarter, it's not going to let itself be switched off. And so we only get one chance at doing this. So how are we going to live with these super intelligences? Right now, there is two big pushes happening on trying to make that good. Because once something is smarter, it's going to be, I mean, think about your own life. 
Who today has been thinking about ants or chimpanzees or any other species a whole lot? Not that much. And so it's going to be so much smarter than us. It might just ignore us. It might hog all the energy resources on Earth and so forth. So a lot of challenges there. One challenge is how do you make it do what we want it to do? That's called value alignment. Most of the time when people ask for something, they ask it wrong. Everything I touch, I want to turn into gold. That's a bad request because you can't eat, you can't hug people, you can't do anything. Um, that's what people do. And so the AI needs to be smarter than just listening to the exact thing that people ask for. Another direction is to build bionic brain add-ons. So high bandwidth brain machine interfaces might just be an extension of our brain, make us all super intelligent. You might say, is that even possible? Well, hasn't been done, so who knows? But it's, there is potential there. Because if you look evolutionary, the brain has been growing with more and more compute added on over time. So maybe if we have a sufficiently high bandwidth interface from our brain to a cloud AI or AI in our phone, we might be able to extend our own intelligence uh, well beyond what we have today. All right, here is what I, I covered in this uh, session here. If you want to keep up with what's happening in AI at Berkeley, here is a newsletter and a blog that you can uh, subscribe to. And uh, OpenAI has a newsletter and blog also. Actually, this one is by Jack Clark, report, former reporter of Bloomberg, and gives you an update every week of the latest that happened in AI commercially, technically, and uh, politically. So I would say if you do only one thing from this session, I'd say subscribe to this newsletter. It'll keep you up to date on AI with just a two minute effort every week. If you want to dig deeper, here are a few pointers to go learn on your own. Thank you.